Well, Happy New Year. 2015. It's hard to believe it's 2015. A year of promise. We've been made promises by movies. We're going to have flying cars and hoverboards this year. I hope you're excited. Because uh, I am. I can't wait to get mine. Um, that's what's on my Christmas list next year. A hoverboard. That's it. Of course, knowing me, I would be the first one to wreck it and break my arm on that. But uh, 2015, a new year. And we're going to be looking at why this can be the best year yet. Why God uh, has a desire for each of us to experience a banner year, a year unlike any other. So open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. You can use the Bible in front of you. That's on page 230. Or if you're going to use the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app, on the left side there's a tab for live events. You click on that, click on search for live events, and this morning's notes will pop right up. You know, a new year means new possibilities. It means New Year's resolutions. Uh, as I looked over social media the past few weeks, there were a lot of people talking about resolutions and what they were going to do differently this year than from years previous. Uh, even uh, many uh, personalities on TV were posting what, what their typical New Year's resolutions were, and uh, they kind of came in uh, cycles. They said every year they make the same resolutions, and if you make the same resolution every year, it's probably not a very good resolution. Uh, they, you know, it came to... Uh, working out more or exercising more or eating right you know, or on the Christian side, reading more of the Bible, reading it every day, making a dedication to read Scripture, reading through the Bible in a year, picking one of the myriad of reading plans that are in the Bible app and they email it to you or send you a notification and say, hey, you haven't done your Bible reading today or memorizing more Scripture. You know, we make these resolutions, even if they're subconscious, we say, you know, I'm going to do better with that this year. I'm going to do something a little bit different. There's always great expectations for a new year. We come into January, we think there can be all kinds of new possibilities. At the beginning, there's great potential for greatness. We're thinking about now, well, what, what, what do I want to have accomplished by December 31, 2015? You know, at the beginning, there's always a chance that we're going to have a banner year personally or as a family or as a church of God. And we're going to see some of that in today's passage of Scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 7. But what's just happened in 1 Samuel, this is a, a, a story of great irony, as we're going to see this morning. Uh, the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, uh, it's not totally about a man named Samuel, but it's written during uh, events during his lifetime. Uh, it starts off about him, and he comes into the story periodically throughout the two books. But uh, back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, the scripture says that Samuel went from a boy and began to grow up. He grew up into a man, and it, the scripture says God was with him, and God let none of his words fall to the ground, which simply means everything Samuel said, God took it, and God used it to do something great. And every person in Israel knew that Samuel was God's man. He was the man God had chosen to lead them. He was uh, the man God was going to use as his prophet. And so he began to garner that respect. Just people innately gave him that respect because he was the prophet. You know, I mean, when there was a prophet of God in the nation, everyone... Uh, First of all, didn't want to cross his path for fear that a prophecy would come down uh, poorly on them, but they knew that he had a special power from God. Samuel was God's prophet, and he would prophesy over the nation. But at that time when Samuel was, was, had grown and he was God's prophet for the nation, it, the Israelites decided that they were going to go out and battle the Philistines. And if you know anything about Old Testament Scripture, the Israelites and the Philistines were going at it a lot. They fought all the time. Uh, and at this point, the, the Philistines, uh, during history, were a little bit more powerful than the Israelites. And so they had been oppressing the Israelites for some time. But the Israelites decided, we've had enough, we're going to go and we're going to fight them. And so the Israelites gathered up their forces, they went and they set up their camp at a town called Ebenezer. Uh, they went and set up their camp at a town called Ebenezer. And that's going to be a very important place in a minute. So the Israelite camp is at Ebenezer, and the Philistine camp is nearby. And the Israelites go out and they fight a battle, and the Israelites lose. 
And 4,000 of their men die in that battle. They retreat back to Ebenezer. And they're mourning their loss. And they're thinking, what could we have done different? How could we have uh, uh, fought better? What was a better strategy to go out against the Philistines? And it begins to go through the camp. Well, we didn't win because God wasn't with us. And so they decide to bring up the Ark of the Covenant, which was the big golden box with the angels on top that God had Moses create that was a symbol of God's presence. The Ark wasn't God's presence. It was a symbol of what God could do for them. But the people at this point in their spiritual walk were confused. And they said, let's bring up the ark. That means we're going to bring God to where we want God to be, and he will go out with us and fight this battle with us. And so they bring the ark into their camp there at Ebenezer, and when the ark comes into their camp, everyone cheers. There's this great shout from the camp of the Israelites. It's so loud, Scripture says, that it causes uh, the ground to shake, and that the Philistines in their camp are scared about what's happening over with the Israelites. And the Israelites are encouraged. But the two guys who brought the ark into the camp were men who were notorious for their wicked ways. They did terrible, wicked things in God's church using God's utensils, uh, but they could still continue to lead the nation spiritually. And they bring the ark, these two evil men bring the ark to the Israelites. And so the Israelites are pumped up. They're excited. They've got the ark. They go out to battle now with the ark leading the charge. But again, they lose the battle. And this time, they lose 30,000 men. So before they had just lost 4,000, this time they lose 30,000. Not just that, the two wicked men who were attending the Ark of the Covenant get uh, killed as well. And the Philistines capture the Ark. This was long before Indiana Jones found it and put it in a warehouse here in America. But the, the Philistines capture the Ark and take it away back to their home country. And this is devastating news. The man who at that time was the priest of the nation was the father of those two wicked men who were attending the ark. Uh, When he heard that his two sons were killed, he mourned, he grieved. But when he heard that the ark was taken by the Philistines, he wept, fell over in his chair dead. It was the ark that broke his heart that was taken. So the ark is taken, the the Israelites have suffered this terrible, devastating failure at Ebenezer. 34,000 of them have died, but the Philistines begin to have problems. They take the ark of the covenant that was a representation of God's presence, and they put it in the temple of one of their fake gods. They put it right next to the statue of one of their fake gods. They come in the next morning to worship their fake god, and the statue has fallen over and is bowed down to the ark. And they say, well, maybe some wind blew through and knocked it over. So they pick the statue up and set it up and go back out. The next day they come in. Again, the statue is knocked over, bowing down to the ark, and this time it is chopped up into pieces. Uh, And so they begin to say something is wrong here. In addition to God destroying their fake God, everyone in the town gets struck with tumors. It's uh, wreaking havoc. And so they finally associate this with the ark, and they say, we've got to move this thing out of our town and give it to somebody else. So they send it to another Philistine town, and the same thing happens. Everybody gets these painful tumors. And they begin to pass it from Philistine town to Philistine town to Philistine town. uh, And every single one of them is experiencing the same thing. And they finally come to the conclusion that maybe the Israelites, God is doing this to them. And they say, well, we don't really know for sure. We want to get this out of our country so our people aren't suffering anymore. So what they decided to do was to take the ark and put it on a cart. And they were going to put milk cows in front of the cart, tie up the cart to the milk cows. And they said, if these milk cows who have never gone on any journey, they've just been used for milk. If they happen to go to Israel, then it was Israel's God who did this to us. But if milk cows, they just wander around, then it wasn't Israel's God. And so they're concluding, I mean, their assumption is, of course, cows aren't going to go where they've never gone before. That doesn't make any sense. And so they're assuming that God has no power over this. But as you can assume, the cows went straight to Israel. They didn't venture to one side of the road or the other. When they saw grass or water, they didn't go and eat or drink. They made a beeline for Israel, and the ark returned to where it was supposed to be. And that's where we get when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 7. All this has transpired. The terrible loss at Ebenezer, the ark making its way through uh, the Philistine country, and now it's back in Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 
1. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill, and they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. And so we learn something here. The ark has returned to Israel, but as we're going to see in a moment, Israel has not returned to God. They were trying to fulfill all kinds of rites and rituals to please God, but that's not what pleased God. As David says later on uh, in uh, the Second Samuel days, that it's our heart that pleases God, not our following certain rites and certain rituals or certain traditions. It's what we have in our heart. It's where our heart is when we are serving God that pleases Him. You know, only the position of one's heart can usher in a banner year of God's blessing. But these Israelites here in 1 Samuel 7 didn't understand that yet. The ark, they had uh, taken it to the house of Abinadab, and uh, they uh, consecrated his son Eleazar. Now, that name Eleazar is important because that is a priestly name. Usually, guys in the priestly line only had that name, Eleazar. That wasn't a common name except for priests. And so this family was most likely a line of priests. And so the fact that they took in the ark into their home is in spite of the entire nation not following after God, this particular family was wanting to do what God desired. And so they took a son, a son of the priestly line, they consecrated him, they set him apart. They, they uh, called him to be their priest. And his job was to take care of this ark that had been so neglected over the years. And so it's, that's his job, and we get to verse 2. From the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And so the ark comes back to Israel, and we get a 20 year transition period. Uh, and it says this, this, you know, this isn't a brief time. This isn't a few weeks. This is a very long time, the very words that it uses, 20 years. And Israel has changed their tune. They went from having a sadness because of the suffering that they had experienced from the hand of the Philistines, from losing 34,000 people. Uh, now they are sad because of the condition of their own hearts as they sought after God. It took them 20 years to recognize their own selfishness and their own inward focus, only caring about their own wants and their own preferences, to where we get at the end of that verse that all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now they are pursuing God. They are wanting to follow God. But I also think that's a 20-year period. Scripture calls it a long time. Imagine if they had turned back to God right at the beginning right after their terrible loss at Ebenezer. Imagine if they had turned back to God then. How much could God have done in that 20-year period when they were away from Him? They, could, they missed out on so much God could have done if they had just been willing to follow God at the beginning. You know, how often, though, is that true in our own lives? We ignore God. We, we don't want to acknowledge God. Sometimes we spend a long time missing out on the greatness that God has for us because we would stubbornly rather follow after our own mind's reasoning than God's purposeful pursuits. Look at verse 3. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And so we get the name of one of the gods they're worshiping here, Ashtaroth. Uh, Ashtaroth and Baal, those are two of the gods that the Israelites had adopted from their neighboring country. They're fake gods, not real at all. But what is completely ironic about this is uh, Baal and Ashtaroth were of the family of the same gods that the Philistines worshipped. The same god, that idol that fell over in front of the ark and was chopped up into pieces, was the father in their line of gods of Baal, the ones that the Israelites are worshipping. And so they're wanting to turn back to God, but they still have these areas in their lives where they are worshipping something other than God. They have a priority in their lives of something other than God. And so Samuel steps up in front of them and calls them out on this. 
He says, you know, the Philistines suffered because of the dishonor they held in their hearts. The Philistines suffered uh, because of how they viewed our God and their continued sin. And you want to turn back to God, but you're doing the same thing that they're doing. You see, they were doing those things, and yet they wanted to go to battle and have God bless them in the process. But that's not how God works. God is not going to honor those who bring dishonor on him. God is not going to bless those, even those who inadvertently are taken by pride and selfishness. The key here to Samuel's call to God's people is the phrase that he says, with all your heart. You want to turn back to God with all your heart. You know, sometimes we do things with some of our heart, uh, with a little bit of our heart. But if we were truly honest with ourselves, our whole heart is absent. And that's exactly why many New Year's resolutions don't uh, are not fulfilled. You know, we want to lose weight. We want to get in better shape with some of our heart, but we want ice cream with the rest of our heart. This is coming from a guy who has a half gallon of bluebell in his freezer right now uh, that I'm thinking about. Let me hang on. Got, I also got some M&Ms in the cut. Anyway. Um, you know, we have some heart here and some heart there, but we give in to the ice cream. If we really wanted to lose weight, we'd, I would stop buying ice cream at Walmart, but I like ice cream too much. Uh, you know, and, and it's the same thing. If we uh, want to spend more time in Scripture, we want to know God better through the Bible, but with the other part of our heart, we also want that extra half hour of sleep in the morning. We know that we've got that little bit of time, and so we hit the snooze, or like if you're like me, just turn the alarm off altogether and roll over. You see, if we are coming to God, even with the semblance of our whole heart, then there are some things that we have to get rid of. There are some things that we have to stop doing. Look at verse 4. Let's see what the Israelites did. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. The people did exactly as Samuel had instructed them. During those 20 years, their hearts had been brought to a place where they were now willing to be used by God. They were now ready and willing to, have, to let God have his way with their lives. They went through their lives, their homes, and their cities, and they removed anything and everything that was taking up space in their hearts. You know, you have to make room for what God has to bring into your life. You have to clean out your closet. Sometimes a banner year begins with a big trash can. A banner year begins with a big trash can. You know, we just had Christmas, and uh, if your family is anything like our family, we follow the tradition at Christmas where you give each other presents. Did anybody exchange gifts at Christmas time? Half of you did. Okay. Uh, well, uh, at Christmas time, you know, we exchange gifts, and uh, we something we have started doing, and a friend of mine actually put a name to this thing. He calls it the sweater rule. You know, every Christmas or birthday, uh, they live in a cold climate. His wife likes to get sweaters, and he tells her, if you want a sweater for Christmas, that means you have to throw one away or we have no room in our closet. He says, you've got to get rid of one in order to get one. You want something, you've got to make room for it. It's the same thing uh, with God. If we want room for what he's got, we've got to clear out some of the junk that we have accumulated and put into our uh, spiritual heart closet. We can accumulate all kinds of habits and things that we, we make up our time with, we make up our thought processes with, and we fill it with all kinds of unnecessary things. And yet we want God to uh, help us. We want God to intervene. We want God to bless us, but we're not willing to give up anything we've already got. We want to, uh, God to add to the pile we've already got filled up in our closet. But in order to have a banner year with God, you first have to remove things that are taking up closet space in your life. Maybe it's habits. Maybe it's certain friends. Maybe it's certain TV shows that you're not willing to give up. Maybe it's social media time. Maybe it's gossip. Just think about that one for a second. Let me go a little further. A little, let me dig a little deeper. Maybe it's negative thoughts 
that more often than not migrate into negative talk. Because if you really thought about that, it, it, our negative thoughts and negative talk are those of God. Is God the author of those things? You know, spreading a negative spirit among the working of God is in itself sin. And that's what the people were doing with their, uh, their fake gods they had in their houses. They wanted God to bless them, but they didn't want to get rid of the bad stuff. They wanted God to, to, to take care of them, to provide for them, but they wouldn't get rid of the stuff they had amassed. You know, maybe we need to give up certain attitudes or motivations. Or here's a big one. Maybe you need to give up the right to be offended. You know, Facebook these days is filled with people posting articles or people responding to somebody else's post, and they've been offended by it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a social media fight. Uh, uh, you just click on the, the comments, and you can read, and it's about 20 comments long, and it's two people going back and forth fighting about something that absolutely means nothing. Uh, it's because somebody got offended about something that doesn't really matter, you know? Life is too short to be offended. Life is too short to, to be worried about those kinds of things. There are people dying and going to hell, and we're worried about the inane thing that somebody said on the news channel, you know? And, and we need to be more focused on what God has for us. We've got to begin with a big trash can. And so the people of Israel, they listen to Samuel, they turn back to God, and then Samuel gives them another instruction. Verse 5. Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So Samuel wanted to pray for the people. He had given them instruction, clean out the junk. They did. And he said, okay, now I want to pray for you. Uh, but he did not want his prayer to be a, a, a simple, offhanded phrase that he says without thinking. You know, like many of us, including myself, we're guilty from time to time of saying, oh, I'll pray for you, and then we forget. At least we forget until the next time we see the person, and then we say a little quick prayer so we can tell them, oh, I prayed for you. you know? And that's not what Samuel is doing here. That's not what he has in mind. He said, I want to pray for you. So he said, come to me, and I will pray for you in your hearing. In the same way, we should offer prayer personally as we have opportunity. You're on the phone with somebody who needs prayer, pray for them right then. You're talking to somebody who needs prayer. Don't just say, I'll pray for you. Pray for them right there in the moment. That's what Samuel is doing. He said, get the entire nation to come to me at Mizpah, and we're going to pray for your hearts and for what God is going to do through you. Look at verse 6. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now, there's some interesting things in this verse. First of all, they took water and they poured it out before the Lord. They poured it out as, as a form of worship and commitment. Pouring water out before the Lord in that context, in that way, happens nowhere else in Scripture. Nowhere else does somebody take water, pour it out in worship and commitment. This is the only place that that happens. That gesture they are making is a statement of, of their faithfulness to God, that, that serving God is more important to them than their life sustaining water. And then it says they fasted. You know, fasting is withholding of your food so that you might better worship or communicate with God. Now, I don't understand how the, 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 in this case with fasting, how physiologically that works. All I know is that when you fast, you withhold from food for a time, there is a spiritual attuneness that you did not have previously. It's almost as though fasting is like a, a spiritual superpower that you can uh, know God better and experience God in a, a new way and understand what he's saying differently. Uh, and that's what's happening here. The people are pouring out their water. They're worshiping. They're fasting. They're saying, we have sinned against the Lord. They're wanting God to take total control of their lives. You know, and, but something happens. They're in the midst of doing what God wants them to do, and the enemy is at work. Verse 7. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. 
Now the Philistines here, everybody's gathering. The entire nation is coming together in one city. And historically, when that would happen, when an entire nation would gather together in one city, they're preparing for war. And so the Philistines hear this. They know uh, 20 years ago they defeated Israel, killed 34,000 of their people, and now the Israelites are all gathering together in one city, and the Philistines uh, begin to get a little antsy. They begin to think, okay, well, they're gathering for battle. They're going to come down and attack us. This is not going to be a good thing. And so the Philistines gather together, and they go out to try to attack Israel beforehand, a preemptive strike. Uh, they're going up there to Mizpah while the Israelites are praying, while the Israelites are fasting, while the Israelites are not drinking any water. And now I don't know if you've ever not got, gone without water or fasted before, but you're not at your strongest during that time. And so there, the Israelites are physically weak. They are pouring themselves out before God, having no idea that the Philistines are knocking at their door to come and attack them. Look at verse 8. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And so the Israelites, in the midst of their worship service there, they realize that the Philistines are coming, and they don't have time to go and do anything. And so they sit there, and they're right before Samuel, and they say, Pray for us right now. Cry out to God. They're not, it's not some simple prayer. They're saying, Cry out. Uh, uh, scream out for help to our God that he may come and save us. They're in the middle of what God wanted for them, turning back to him, and they're being attacked. Have, you know, it's natural. If you are in the middle of where God wants you, somebody's coming for you. You can count on it. Put on the Kevlar on your back. Somebody is gunning for you. Satan does not want you to be where God wants you to be. He is going to do what he can to stop you if you're going where God wants you to go. Satan thinks that if he can knock you out of God's plan, he can thwart God's purposes. Satan's purpose isn't you. Satan's purpose is to stop God. And we know from Revelation that he does not win. He does not have success. Uh, that's what the end of the book says. But it's the in-between that can cause us problems sometime. And so the Israelites, uh, they, are su they are pursuing God they are being pursued also by the enemy. And their number one option, their first thing they do is pray. They don't run home and grab their swords. They don't assemble into battle lines. They drop to their knees in prayer. You see, option number one in having a banner year of God's blessing is always prayer. Always prayer. Prayer. That's the foundation. That is level one before you go on to other things. Step one, pray. Step two, refer to step one. Now look at verse nine. Now we're going to find out in a minute the Philistines are close. Uh, we don't know exactly how close. We know they are very close. Uh, almost to the point the Israelites can turn around from where they are worshiping and see the Philistines on the horizon as they're there having their service. They call out to Samuel to pray, and we get verse 9. Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. So Samuel sacrificed to God and cried out. Not some unthinking prayer, a call for help. They desperately needed God's intervention. They needed God to do something. Their last encounter with the Philistines had been an overwhelming defeat. It had been an utter failure. They knew that the only way they were going to find success was under the banner of God's blessing. The only way that we are going to find success is under the banner of God's blessing. So not only does a banner year begin with a big trash can, a banner year begins with a bold call. Samuel is there in front of the people calling out to God, asking for his rescue, asking for his salvation uh, for the people. When the last time they were in that situation, they had failed, they had been defeated, they had been killed. But the people had changed. The people had a need, and they knew that the only possible way to fulfill that need was God's hand of help. They needed God's rescue. So Samuel offered up a cry for help that could only have been answered by God. And then we have some of the most encouraging, I think, words in Scripture. They call out to God for help, and it says, The Lord answered him. 
He didn't wait. He didn't have to wait a long time. He didn't have to continue to call out. He prayed one time, and it says, the Lord answered him. The Lord answered the bold call from Samuel. So not only are we to clear out the former things if we're to experience a banner year, we must be persistent in prayer. A banner year only follows a path prepared by prayer. The pavement has been laid by prayer. So the Philistines are not only coming after the Israelites while they're worshiping God, they are almost upon them. They are literally almost within an arrow's distance. We get to verse 10. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below beth Car. And so in the previous uh, verse, we saw it said the Lord answered him. And now we see what that answer looked like. Uh, God responded to Samuel's call for help with an audible reply. God thundered greatly from the sky. In that day and time, uh, societies generally thought they believed that battles were fought on two planes. Uh, one on earth, one uh, in the atmosphere. The humans fought on earth, deities fought in the sky. And so for God to reply with a great thunderclap uh, meant that God was sending a message to the Philistines. And it says, it says, he thundered against the Philistines. Now I've tried to think about what that looks like, having thunder go against uh, somebody. And I, I can't quite wrap my head around what that looks like or what that means. Uh, and, but however it was, the Israelites understood it as God was thundering against the Philistines. The Philistines understood that the Israelites' God was thundering against them, and it threw them into confusion. They were scared out of their minds, not knowing what happened uh, in this moment. These Israelites were not supposed to be strong. These Israelites were not supposed to have a God of power. These Israelites are in the midst of a worship service fasting, so they don't have physical strength. And the Philistines had a superior army, so it should have been an easy fight. But because the Israelites were pursuing God, they found that God went before them and was intervening ahead of them. As the Israelites turn around from their worship service, they see and they hear God thunder against the Philistines, see the Philistines running around in confusion. Uh, they realize God has done something for them. God has laid out the road in front of them. But that didn't mean they could sit back and do nothing. The Israelites saw God do something, but they still had to act. The Israelites prayed for God's intervention. God intervened, but the Israelites still had something to do. They had to go and pursue the enemy. God's banner of blessing came when their actions accurately duplicated their words of faith. You know, if we offer God genuine words of faith, the only way we can experience a banner year is when our actions display that genuine faithfulness to God. Look at verse 12. We get to the ironic part of the passage. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. Now Ebenezer means stone of help. And this stone was to serve as a memorial for all of God's people to remember. God's help had come, and he helped them when his faithful followers asked for it. Now it's not odd simply because uh, Charles Dickens used it as the first name for the bad guy in the Christmas Carol, a stone of help Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. But if you remember back earlier in the story, Ebenezer was the, the place of Israel's great failure. Ebenezer was the place where Israel did not follow God and they lost 34,000 people. It's probably something they've tried to forget. They don't want to remember Ebenezer because they, at, at Ebenezer, they did not follow God and 34,000 of their friends and family died. And so they have tried not to remember it. And Samuel brings out this big stone and drops it on the ground and says, we're going to call this Ebenezer. And the pit drops out of their, their chest at that moment. 
No, no, we don't want to remember Ebenezer. We don't want to remember that time that we failed. And Samuel, he, he's telling them, it's not about your failure. It's about God's rescue. It's about God's deliverance. There's a difference in Samuel's communication. There's a difference between the battle for Ebenezer and the stone of Ebenezer. Because in the battle for Ebenezer, the Israelites tried to help themselves under the feigned guise of divine help. They said, oh, God's going to help us. They played the God card, but they intended the entire time to do it all themselves. It was uh, their work. They wanted to help themselves. So that's what the battle of Ebenezer represents. And, And Samuel is telling them, the stone of Ebenezer, that is for us to remember, God helped you when you could not help yourselves. God helped you when you were physically weak, when you were spiritually broken, when you were ready to pursue God and willing to follow after him. God provided the provision, the stone of Ebenezer. God's great banner of blessing came not when the people were puffed up, lacking humility, but when they actually remembered from where their help came The people are to remember that up until now, God has helped them. So, of course, he will be available to help in the coming days as well. Verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. God's blessing here was not a one-time thing. It says all the days of Samuel. The Philistines never came back into Israel's borders. Samuel's faithfulness, leading the people to faithfulness, brought God's banner of blessing on the nation and was extended for years into the future. God's banner of blessing has lasting effects much farther than the immediate need if we would pursue God's purposes. A banner year can easily turn into a banner decade when we are following God's directions. Verse 14. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath. And and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. And we get this last little sentence there. It's almost like a throwaway line. The whole story has been about Israel and the Philistines and their struggle and Israel's return to God. And then we get this one sentence about another nation called the Amorites. You see... Once God brought victory to Israel over the Philistines, others in the region were very eager to make peace. God's banner of blessing affected more than just the Israelites and the Philistines. Even those remotely acquainted with God's followers found peace because of their own proximity to God's people. God's people remembered where their help came from, and then they communicated that to everyone they interacted with. So not only does a banner year begin with a big trash can, begin with a bold call, a banner year begins by remembering God's help. God's help is what must be remembered, not our own. How we can best line out our year, how we can best line out our year will result in the battle of Ebenezer when what we need is the stone of Ebenezer. We need to remember that our help comes from the strength of God, not our own cleverness of mind. So do you want to have a banner year? One unlike any other, a year of unequaled blessing. Well, God's banner of blessing begins first and foremost with believing in God. You're not going to receive God's blessing if you are not a part of his followers. And that begins, as scripture tells us, in believing in Jesus, his son who came and died and rose from the dead so that we don't have to experience pain and punishment, but we get to experience heaven. God wants you to experience that. That's the purpose you were created, to have a relationship with God. And you cannot fulfill your purpose if you do not believe that Jesus came. And Jesus died, and Jesus rose from the dead, giving you access to heaven. And so if we're to experience God's blessing, that is the first thing we've got to do, is we have to believe. Not only that, we need to believe, and the first act of obedience for a believer, according to Jesus himself in Matthew 28, is to be 
baptized. It's a symbol of what God has done for you and through you and the life you're to live for him, to believe, to be baptized, and to become a member of God's church, to be using what God has given you to use. Uh, Not just a member on paper, but a member on purpose. Not just a regular attender. We have a category for regular attender in our software. I hate that category uh, because that's not in Scripture. Scripture talks about uh, people who want to use what God has gifted them with to serve his purpose in his church to further his kingdom. And so we want to be believers, we want to be baptized, and God desires us to be a part of his church. And so we must do those things to have a banner year, but then we must do, as we've seen demonstrated in 1 Samuel 7, we have to ask ourselves, what do you need to throw away? What do you need to get rid of? What do you have in your life that is taking up space, that is occupying your, your, your mind, your heart, your time, your money, that doesn't need to be there? It, need, it, need, it can be replaced by whatever God's got for you in 2015. What do you need to get rid of? And then is your life characterized by prayer? Do you regularly cry out to God for help? Or is prayer an afterthought that you say by rote before you eat or fall asleep uh, praying the same prayer every night? Is it meaningful? Does it come from the heart? Is it purposeful? Are you crying out the same way Samuel cried out here in 1 Samuel 7? And then finally, do you remember that God is your help? Do you remember what God has done for you in the past so that you are reassured of his help in the future? If you're still on this planet, God still has a purpose for you. God still has a purpose for you. And because he has helped you in the past, because he has provided for you in the past, he will provide for you in the future if you are following after him and pursuing his purposes. 